And I think it's easier to be successful than people think. Like if you literally don't quit, you'll eventually find your way. The best of the best, think of the best in business. They said their most down time, their lowest moments was after they won the championship because they put all their impetus and all their meaning into a result, into winning a championship. You work with a lot of business people who aren't mm. starting out. They're people trying to get to the next level. Like what's their biggest problem? Well, you have to do identify two things. You have to identify what your next level actually is. And you've got to figure out what what up, well builders? Today, I got myself a performance coach. This dude was grinding it out like myself in pro sports. He was doing it in basketball. He played overseas. He actually got to coach the Brooklyn Nets um, as a shooting coach where they went from, I think, 28th in three-point percentage to second, um, just kind of emulating some of these techniques he's been teaching. And then he's transition from that to then coaching CEOs and other people. And now I got him into the studio today. David Nurse, what's up, man? Ryan, appreciate you having me on. Yeah, Thank you. thanks for coming out. Absolutely. Dude. So obviously we can relate on a lot of fronts with uh, sports not working out the best for us, you know, to what we want our best shot. But now we get to talk to cameras. So, yeah. <laughs> Never would we have it's imagined the next this. Best this is the competition that we have now. This is the competition yeah. we have now. And so you've been speaking on stages. You've written books now about uh, taking action. Mm. And I think it's a really important thing for people, um, whether they're getting started or even to the next level. Right. Absolutely. Because I think uh, business owners face complacency every step of the way, whether you're like, dude, I don't know if I should take the risk and start this thing or mm you've accomplished your goal and now you're like, dude, should I stay here and play it safe or should I try and take the risk again and go to the next level? That's so good. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're at in terms of if you haven't accomplished anything and you feel completely stuck or you're having success, it's always taking the next step. And I don't say that in a way of overwhelm. You might hear that and think like, well, I have to keep going and keep going and keep going. Well, there is no end spot. There literally is no, you made it and you're good. I was having a lunch this summer with a couple of friends of mine, one who coaches the Miami Heat, Eric Spolstra, and the coach of the Rams, Sean McVay. Mm -hmm. And they, the, the, the biggest thing that I took away from, it's like a mastermind of, of leadership and everything, but the biggest thing that I took away from that, two coaches at the top of their sports, mm -hmm. so the, the best of the best, think of the best in business, they said their most down time, their lowest moment was after they won the championship. Mm -hmm. After Spo won the NBA championship. He was so down. After McVay won the NFL championship, he came out in the public and said he was thinking about retiring because they put all their impetus and all their, you know, all their meaning into a result, into winning a championship. So when I say taking a step forward, no matter where you're at in life, it's the exhilarating journey of constant growth that is the, the competition. And we love the competition, whether it's sports, whether it's business, whether it's podcasting, the competition is what juices us. And it's one of the main things that I see when people understand that, that will take them to the next level. Because I'm a big believer that y you don't stay the same. Mm -hmm. You're either going backwards or you're going forwards. And it's the, everybody talks about the, you know, the 1% rule and it's become way too overplayed, but there is a, a uh, mathematic formula that is one to the power of 365 is one, but 1.01 1 .01 to the power of 365 is 37.8. Just the one step forward can make all the difference, not quickly, but over the long term. Mm. So, you know, with sports, a lot of people don't even know who Spolstra and McVeigh are, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> as a Filipino, I, I like Spolstra. Yes. So, you, you know, this dude's, I think he's probably the longest tenured coach right now. I mean, he's, he's yeah. been the, the Heat's coach for He just signed the time. largest contract in North American sports history. Cool. How much? Uh, 120 over 10 years. Coaches, coach. don't, coaches yeah. don't send t sign 10-year deals. Yeah, they don't get $100 million deals. No, either. but he's built such a great culture. Yeah, he's heat culture. He, the heat culture. And he's told me about this too. He's like, we, it, it, and I've seen it, and this can go for anybody who's building a culture in a company, they, he genuinely cares about the players. Yeah. I was with him in Miami. He just got into a scuffle publicly with one of his star players. So think about like your, your best performer. You're getting into an argument on national television. And I'm thinking like, oh, well, I mean, what's going to go on and everything? And, and he's like, man, it's, it's, it's all good. The, <laughs> the, the, the player came up and said, hey, that's my bad. I take ownership. Like, I'm here for the team. Spolstra told him how much he cared about him as a player. So the the 
actually caring about the people. Yeah. And when I speak to companies and the Chick-fil-A's and these, these top companies, the ones that have the best culture, this might sound really simple and really basic, but it's everything. It's not business decisions that affect people. It's people decisions that affect business. They actually care about the people. Mm. Yeah. We've been in the midst of changing our culture about the last five months. So I've had a lot of turnover as I've gone on this mission of just revamping all of it. And yeah, you might not have seen that now as you walk through today, but it's been this process of like reshifting the culture. And it's funny because, um, you know, like we have the wealthy way and then, you know, you start to hear about these. I I actually was watching sports because I'm aware of like how these great teams are building culture and they have success for the long haul. And, you know, you got like, you know, the heat culture, the heat way, you know, uh, mm. When the Patriots were so good for so long, it was always the Patriot way. You want to play for us? <laughs> I don't give a crap what you've done to this point. You're going to fall in line with how we do things around here. Sure. Um, and, you know, I'm starting to see that with other organizations that are successful for a long time. Like you've seen it with um, the Dodgers and the Braves yeah. and these teams that are just constantly having success. Right. And the one thing is they have culture. Yeah, well, speak into that because I think that's, it's really important to, to understand this. And culture is one of those hot button items that you, everybody says, hey, we want to have the best culture. Okay, show me what that means. Very few know how to actually do it. Mm-hmm. And I've watched you from years ago and then meeting you and then really following you on a day to day. And you have a sense of consistency about you in terms of what you're posting, the content that you're posting. So that I see from the outside, but talk, like I want to hear from the <laughs> inside too of like, what have you done to really actively, you know, go for this? Hey, we're changing this culture and this is the way it's going to be because it's very tough. Yeah, it is tough to change culture, especially if you've been successful before with a right. different type of culture. Right. Totally. And so, you know, for me, um, as time has gone on, uh, I've grown as a person sure. and as a business owner and everything else. Right. And so when you first start out, you don't really know what you're doing. I mean, you're solopreneur, you're hiring a couple of people who are usually your buddies <laughs> and you just kind of rolling with it. And point. then you start to get some employees and you're like, man, um, you know, why are there starting to be problems and, you know, different things you realize, well, there's no standards, there's no expectations. Good, there's it's good. There's no, this person values this, but you, this person values that. And you you know, only want this happening. And Mm. so, you know, when I hired a business coach for the first time, I, um, first thing we did was create our core values. Mm. And so, you know, core values are important. We've had them for, you know, four years now. And, um, I started with four. I actually added a fifth when I did this culture shift. And so like our original core values were, um, serve others, uh, play fair, train daily and no ego. And so serve others, obviously, Hey, I want people who want to help people, right? Play fair. I want people with integrity. Train daily. This one's that that improvement you just talked about. Mm. Like, let's improve 1% every day, right? Um, and then no ego is like, yo, if we do those things, we're going to kill it. Now let's stay humble about it. Yeah. Let's humbly kill it. Um, that doesn't mean let's be soft and let's not talk about what we are because we are killers. We are savages. And mm. I'm not going to sit here mm. and be like, yeah, it's all good. You know, no, I don't want false humility. But I do not want totally. ego. Totally. But then the fifth one we added, as it just became apparent to me, as as uh, I've been in business longer and longer, and I've you know once you go through trials of um, tough years in business, losing people, people talking crap, all this stuff, you realize like, man, what is it that's irritating me about certain people and why we're losing them? And I realized we were missing one core value with it. And that new core value that supersedes all four is faith. Yes. And, you know, with faith, look, obviously I talk about my faith a lot in Christ and that is obviously super important, right? But you don't have to be a Christian to work for me. You know, it's not about that. Mm -hmm. What faith is to me beyond um, with God is, dude, you got to have faith in the company and what we're doing. Totally. You got to have faith in our mission. You got to have faith in our products. You got to have faith in the person next to you that they're going to do their job so that you can do your job. You know, you got to have faith in a decision you may not agree with, but you know, like, look, that may, we're not going to agree on everything all the time, but I have faith that, you know what, they're making the decision for the best interest of everyone. Right. Um, 
And so the hard thing becomes you start to have conflict when your faith is uh, shaken, right? Because lots of things can shake in faith or change your faith, right? Uh, we're going in a new direction like that we never have gone before. That requires faith to say, well, dude, Ryan, we've been flipping houses in Vegas for 10 years now almost. And we've been, why are we going to go do it nationwide? That's scary. <laughs> but me, yeah. that's saying, no, dude, this is yes. the way we're going to go. Yes. You better believe in it, even though it's scary. Um, faith is an, a, another example. Like, you know, somebody could come up with you for a while and then all of a sudden their life changes, right? You're going in one direction. Now they got you know, different people in their life. Maybe they're married now. Maybe they got kids and like, it's no longer, um, you know, I have kids and I'm married, but you know, you just have different life to, or they get a divorce or something happens. And it's just like, now the alignment's off yeah. and their purpose and thing is very different than what yours now is. Wealth Builders, you might have recently heard that we launched Wealthy University, which has access to all of our courses. You get weekly calls with me and our team. You also get access to special trainings, many of which have been done by people who are on this podcast, as well as recordings of WealthCon and other workshops and events that we've done. But even though that was good, I actually want to make it risk-free for you to try for yourself. I'm giving all of the podcast listeners a 14-day free trial by simply going to wealthyuniversity.com slash podcast. So if you go check out that link, you'll be able to get access to your 14-day free trial right now. You'll be able to go check out the course. You'll be able to go check out calls, trainings, and everything else, and then see if it's a fit for you. There's literally no risk to doing it. So go to wealthyuniversity.com slash podcast and go get your free 14-day trial of Wealthy University today. I love that on so many levels. And I consult for this company, a multi-billion dollar company, and they were just all in disarray. And the exact thing that we did is what you're talking about, setting the standards. We called mm -hmm. them the non-negotiables. Yep. But number one was no ego. Mm. That is the hardest thing to get out of a competitive culture. Yes. Sports, business, if there's ego, you will fail. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about too, of all the, the faith, the same mission, the same vision, it's so hard to find people that care about what you care about as much as you care about it. It's yeah. just incredibly hard to find. Yeah. But if you can get people on the same mission and the same vision and have no ego that are coachable, that are continuing to approve, you're going to win. Yeah. It, it, tr it trumps any talent. This company that I was consulting for had incredible talent. They were getting all the biggest names and for COOs and product and sales, and they had no rhythm of communication either. So I think one of the biggest things too is setting up your systems. So once you know you have your team, like you're talking about, this is sports, business, anything in life, your your relationships, who you are in, in your personal development, is setting up your your systems. So what are you doing on a daily basis so that that you're really good. Like, what are your strength zones? What are you empowering your employees for? You're talking about, you know, you're empowering the people that work for you. So your systems plus your process, what is your process? Your daily habits, your daily habits, your system plus your process equals your results. Mm -hmm. Far too often in business and sports, I'm sure you've seen this, when you look for the results, when you try to say, hey, how can I hit this number this month? Or how are we going to hit these goals? You won't hit them. Mm -hmm. because you can't search for the results. You can't aim for the results and get the results. You have to focus on the system and the process. It's like I do with NBA players. I'll just give this example of, I had a player that I was working with and he was you know, borderline going to be out of the NBA. And he was just the, the best guy when he scored a lot of points, the results. Yeah. What everybody from the outside says, that's really good. What you should, what you should track yourself in is what they say. But when he had a bad game, he was a completely different person. Yeah. So we said, we're going to take away any points per game. We're going to take away any stats, any results. All we're going to focus on is the system, who you are. What do you do better than anybody else? He was phenomenal catch and shoot threes from the corner and attacking the rim in transition, getting to the hoop. Two things. That's it. Only focus on two things. What are your process? Daily habits. We practice that. We'd study film on that. All we were doing is counting how many times in the game that he got to his great shots and then working on that. Never looked at stats, never looked at results. Mm -hmm. At the end of that year, that's when COVID happened, when it shut down, LeBron James, who everybody knows, was the Western Conference Player of the Week, and this player, Norm Powell, was the Eastern Conference Player of the Week. Mm. So taking away those results, seen as a great success, 
and focusing on your system, your process. So yeah. that's one important thing for anybody really in their own life and their goals that they have and in people that run businesses as well. Yeah, I think it's this interesting thing where you are both obviously focused on results and process because, right, if you don't get results, then... <laughs> you, you have to get them. Yeah. So that's when you go back and tinker. If it's... Yeah. You will, totally. Yeah. you got to make yeah, sure that there is tough. some... And, right. and I, I'm with you because for me, I'm so process driven mm. and I trust the process and I have faith in the process that... I'm not super concerned about the results, at least initially. If I'm seeing the things I want to see, I, I, I actually, I should say I am concerned about the results, but maybe not the end result that everyone else sees. There you go. There's the a long result. Term. Yeah, right. there's a result I am looking for based on the amount of work I'm putting in. Like, hey, okay, did that actually yeah. increase that will end up leading to revenue <laughs> or whatever else, right? True. True. Um, but, you know, at the same time, like with employees and everything else, one thing I have realized is it's hard because process is a long-term thing and most employees aren't doing long-term tasks. They're doing things that need results now. Yeah. For example, point. like our sales team, I've been talking about sales team a lot on the podcast just because <laughs> I'm so in like inside of there right now, fixing yeah. things. And initially, right. You could track process stats like, hey, how many dials did you make? What was your talk time? All of this. And like, we're celebrating those things. We're like, dude, great mm. job. You were on the phone. and But they didn't get no sales. Mm. And so at some point, That's, yeah, it's tough. you yeah. start to say like, you know what? Yeah, I actually really don't care about that. I really just care about what did you do? Yeah. And yeah. because, you know, I'm not here to develop you. Like I'm paying money for leads and everything for you to close right now. That's and I do point. want you to develop, but you got to hit a, at least a minimum standard yeah. while you develop. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, if your process doesn't yield any results, you probably <laughs> have to go change your process. And it's a, I mean, I guess it's wherever you are in your life too. If you're bringing on people and you're building a culture where you're coming in already ready. You're yeah, we're a, a veteran salesman. team who that's needs. That's what I was going to ask you. You're yeah. not a revamping rookie team that's going for the draft. I yeah. get it. I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. we're a veteran team. We got to win yeah. now. We uh, This is not a rebuild year. <laughs> <laughs> what do you find the toughest thing in scaling is? I think scaling is one of the, like you're talking about uh, locally to nationally, and mm -hmm. that's an ultimately one of the biggest scales to do. Yep. Do you have any fear in scaling? I don't have fear. Um, or how about um, difficulties that you see? Do you think it's... Or is it just something you've done? No, everything's difficult. So <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's a given. <laughs> that's a good, that's so a there's not, um, <laughs> that, that's just a given. Yeah. So I think the issues with scaling are number one, most people think they're scaling, but they're doing it. In, well, I, look, scaling is different for everyone, right? Sure. So if you're trying to go from doing one deal to 10 deals, I mean, that that's a 10X. That's, that's a big scale. Um, 10 to 100 is a very tough thing, right? A hundred to a thousand is a tough thing. Mm. And I mean, that's where I'm at. I've been doing a hundred deals a year for many, many years. And so now I'm trying to go to a thousand. Wow. And so you start, the reason you change models is because you realize, well, staying local is just, you won't do that. It's, it's literally impossible. And yeah, there's a, can't. there's a way to do it now with new technology, with new skills, with new everything that we can do it. And so you know, that's kind of the path we're on with that. And it presents all new types of problems <laughs> that you just don't have with doing a yeah. hundred locally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So it is hard. But I also think that it's th probably the hardest part about scaling is just choosing how you want to go about it. Because you could just say, well, yeah, dude, I want to scale this year. I want to go from a hundred to 150. It's like, well, you want to do that. It's not really that much different. You just... Get that some more should leads. Come. Right. That should come. Just work naturally. harder, yeah, essentially, right, is the answer. Right. You get smarter, work harder. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, dude, you want to go from a 10 point score a game to a 30 point score. You, like, you just, there's something completely different so, that has yeah. to happen. Yeah. Totally, man. You might need to, you probably need to change teams. <laughs> you probably need to change your situation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to, there's a lot of things you need to do. I also think it's too, and let me know what you think on this too. Like, you have to have what I've seen from the formula of, we're going back to sports here. 
of all stars, NBA all stars that I've worked with, there's three things that they all have in common, and they don't miss like they don't miss any of these three. One is their their natural ability. They have to have some kind of attribute that they're born with. Yeah, an ability, a talent, a high level talent, and they must know their talent. Yeah, knowing your strengths. And not trying to be good at everything, but be great at one thing. NBA players, they have to know that. They have to have an, what I call insatiable drive. And this is this is a work ethic. Like It doesn't matter if the lights are on. It doesn't matter if they're, they're, they're not filming it on social media. They want more. They actually love the pra- practice aspect of it. You would yeah. think professional athletes love practice. I they, love to practice. See, I yeah. love to practice too. Yeah. But a lot of professional athletes do not love to practice. Yeah. It's just like anything. So they have to have that insatiable drive where they want to they want to kill it in in every in every practice. Yep. And there's a player that I worked with when he was young coming out of college, Shea Alexander. And yeah. I tell this story because he's probably the MVP this year. He's he's that good. Mm-hmm. The first time he stepped on the floor in Santa Monica pre-draft, we we try to crush the player's soul. We test them mentally in the pre-draft process when they're you know, coming out of college, they're going to go to teams, they're working out for teams, you got to see where they're at. So we always put guys through two, three hour workouts, and they're just dead by the end of it. And Shay, this first workout after this grueling two to three hour workout on court comes up to me afterwards and said, coach, when are we going tonight? I was like, this guy's different. And you could tell from that moment yeah. that he had it in him, that he had something different, that that type of insatiable drive. You can't teach that, can you? You can't. I, I, you know what? I don't think you can. Yeah. I honestly don't think you can. There's, there's a couple things I don't think you can actually teach. Natural it's, ability. <laughs> like well, <laughs> you can't. You're born with whatever. You're, you're this tall, this fast. Well, and, it's like you know. a, a friend of mine, Rich Davini, who wrote this book, Attributes, a Navy SEAL. You're born with certain levels of things. Like, yeah. You might be, you're born with more swag. I'm trying as hard as I can to get to your swag level. I might be born with something else more, but you can yeah. increase them, but only to a certain extent. Insatiable yeah. drive being one of those. And I also think killer instinct too. Yeah. Like the ability to be on the court and just want to rip somebody's throat out. Mm-hmm. That I don't think you can develop as much as it's just a born. And the last one I was going to say, they just have this ultimate relentless consistency it doesn't matter what the situation the circumstances they're going to continue to go day after day after day practice 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 continually those three things i think you could take that from the sports world apply it to your life figure out what your strengths are what you're naturally gifted for yeah do you have an insatiable drive do you love the practice part of it? you're not always always going to love the practice part of it but for mm-hmm. the most part And then you just do it no matter what, even when you're getting knocked down, even when you don't see results. I'm sure you've heard by now that WealthCon is coming back to Las Vegas April 18th to the 20th here at the Caesars Palace. Now, here's the thing. Many people listening to this podcast have not been to WealthCon. Maybe you haven't found the time. Maybe the logistics didn't work out and you have no idea how amazing it is. Well, I'm going to actually give you something completely for free so you can get a taste of what we've got going on. I'm going to give you the recordings of our last WealthCon back in January for the two full day experience. You're going to get access to all of the speakers and all of their presentations and everything else right now completely for free by going to wealthcon.org. Now, I don't know how long I keep this up on the website. It's a special thing that I'm trying out. I want to give people a ton of value and I want to let you get a taste of what we're going to be doing in April. So go check it out, wealthcon.org. Go get the free recording and maybe I'll see you at the next one. Yeah, I think, you know, you're bringing that up for like the elite, of the elite, right? I mean, this guy we're talking about is potentially the MVP of the NBA. So, I mean, that's literally the best player in the entire planet Mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if people hear that, they're like, well, dude, I don't know that I I really want (laughs) to rip throats. And I'm like, you know, like, look, we're talking about literally the the 0.0001% of the 0001%. Um, and, and everyone has those things to a degree, like you said. I mean, like you have some kind of natural ability that you're good at, whether you know it or not. You have to. Yeah. Um, everyone has unique everyone. talents, yeah. right? Um, everyone has a certain level of drive that pushes them to succeed. And yep. everyone has a certain level of consistency. And all of them can be approved, even if you are... Um, Shay in this example, because he wasn't, you know, this crazy dude, his first bunch of years in the league. No, he wasn't. And then all of a sudden he just leveled up out of nowhere. But it, I don't think it was out of nowhere. I think it was just super, it 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 just caught up all the work that he had been putting in. Absolutely. 
it's like, yeah, no one sees the, I mean, the cliche is what the overnight success in 10 years, no yeah. one sees all the work that you've done prior mm -hmm. to where you're at now. And you probably get a lot of new people coming on like, man, I want to be like Ryan. How does he do this? You're like, Hey, yo, I've grinded for 15 years <laughs> yeah. to get to this point. Exactly. Like, do exactly what I did. And then we'll talk. I mm -hmm. get it all the time too. It's like, Oh, I want to be a speaker. You want well, do something cool first for 10 to 15 years that actually means something. And then you can go speak on it. You mm -hmm. can't just be a speaker just to be a speaker necessarily. So, yeah, man, I mean, I think it's 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 that. And it's you don't necessarily have to see it from the perspective of, oh, he's this way over the top guy. It's kind of like the Goggins effect. Like people love David Goggins. I'm also tell, like tell people like you don't want to live Goggins life. Like, <laughs> Goggins is so far out there. Yeah. You can't be him. But yeah. you can take some of the principles yeah. and take some of those away and use it to your life just, just like this. But I, I actually think, Ryan, I think it's easier to be successful than, than people think. I, I think it's like there, there's some cheat codes in there. Like the word I, I, I love, don't give upness. Like if you literally don't quit, you'll eventually find your way. You might have to pivot a few times, but you'll eventually find your way. Mm -hmm. Making re Building relationships and connections, like genuine, true connections is the biggest game changer of all. I tell people in their 20s, if you do nothing else, build relationships and true connections. Now, don't network and use people. There's a complete difference. And you go in with a service mentality, and this is going to sound like, oh, you got to serve, serve. But I mean, Jesus comes as, you know, to serve, not to be served. The greatest of all comes to serve others. There's mm -hmm. something with that. And I think kind of getting off track here, but if you come back to any leadership type thing you want to do, look at Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is the greatest leader. Whether you think he's the savior or not, he is the greatest leader in every single aspect of it. Yeah. But the whole service mentality point that I'm talking about is you want, most people want things quick. In this day and age, especially people want things quick. Yeah. If you're willing to play the long game and if you're willing to literally put your phone down Average Americans are on their phone seven hours and seven minutes, screen time, yeah. screen time, seven hours and seven minutes a day. I tell young athletes, like, you want to separate yourself? Put that thing down and just go shoot hoops. <laughs> That's so simple. Yeah. But people like to uh, complicate it more than they should. Yeah, well, I don't know that they complicate it. I mean, there's just more distractions than anything in the world today. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually, speaking on the topic of faith, uh, Rory Vaden's going to be coming on the show soon. Him and Love I have Rory. become good buddies. And um, and he's going to be speaking at my uh, Wealthy Kingdom event, too. He's great, man. But uh, he's got a podcast about apologetics. And he had said something mm -hmm. in there I thought was really good. And he was saying that um, Satan doesn't really come to destroy the way people think. They, you know, they think, oh, dude, this dude is trying to go mess with me and ruin my life. Satan comes more to distract <laughs> yeah, and of course you start to think about it and you're like, yeah, you know, if you could be distracted enough to, to not see the truth hmm. about who Jesus is or to achieve the potential for your life or to distract you from your kids oh. or your spouse or the business you could be building. Oh, so true, man. Like which one you will destroy yourself. If you're distracted, you don't, he doesn't need to like come strike you down and like take away your leg mm. and do these things that people think he's do like, if you're distracted, you already lost. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, think about the greatest distraction in the world. What would you say it is? Your phone. The phone. What yeah. is the, the most prominent phone? The iPhone. And what is their symbol? What is Apple's iPhone symbol? It's just an Apple. With a, with a bite. With a bite. Yeah. That signifies... The yeah, garden. The garden. Yeah. The, yeah, for sure. And it's uh, like C.S. Lewis's book. The um, What's his book that he's, you know what's what I'm talking about. Not The Great Divorce. Um, um, geez, where he plays the devil and he comes and distracts him. Yeah, I forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, I, I totally agree. It's, it's, not, it's not always the things that seem so obvious, but it's the things that take you away from the, the, main, the main thing. And I think we give, you know what, I think we give the devil too much credit too. Mm -hmm. Like the devil, so there were 
two or sorry, one third of the angels fell mm -hmm. at the start of time. And then there, so there's two thirds. The devil's opposite is the archangel Michael. Most people think the devil's opposite is Jesus. The devil is one of the fallen angels. Yeah. So to put dev the devil on the same level of Jesus isn't fair playing field. Yeah, yeah. Like his opposite is the archangel, archangel Michael. But I think that we put too much emphasis on like he is the 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 opposite of Jesus, which he's not. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And you know what I think is interesting on that? We we'll keep going on that because I'm yeah obviously very passionate about this too. Is I'll ask people a lot like, hey, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Mm -hmm. Everybody I ask says yes. Nobody says, hey, you know what? I, I want to go to hell. I want to try that hell thing out. Nobody <laughs> has said that yet. So then I asked them the follow-up question. I'm like, well, if you want to go to heaven, you realize that's living with God. Like, that's what you're going to be doing, praising constantly. Why would you not want to live with God now if that's what you're going to do later? Yeah. People don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Or they just, once again, distraction. Yeah. If you're distracted from thinking Can't about, even think about it, right? That's the main thing. Like when when I start going down the rabbit hole with people, yeah. it's not even like evangelizing. I go, let's just talk about this from a logical perspective right. as business people. Okay, what do you think the most important question to answer on earth is? You know, is it like <laughs> where where how to scale your business, like how to be a good dad, how to be a better boss? Like, what do you think the most important question to answer is? And like. And I go, you know, people will start to really think about it. And you, you don't know what someone will say. It's a very sure. broad question, right? Yeah. But I say, for me anyways, this is just me. I go, I like to start with absolutes because that's how you define a framework of making a decision. Like, okay, let's first start with the absolutes. And it's like, well, what are the only guarantees in life? And the only guarantee in life is that you're going to die. You know, people Absolutely. used to say it was death and taxes, but that's not even true. There that's are lots true. of places you cannot pay taxes. You're right. So, but so death is the only guarantee. And you start to say, okay, if that's for sure what's going to happen, there are people that think certain things happen when you die. And so I'm going to be dead a lot longer than I'm going to be alive. So if that's the case, what happens when I die? Because that's mm. a really important thing to know. Good frame. And just logically speaking, I would want to be sure of what happens when I die more so than what I'm going to spend 30 years of my life doing in business or whatever, 30 years compared to eternity, which one's a bigger thing oh. I should really be thinking about versus being distracted by my freaking iPhone. The, the problem of my business today, mm -hmm. we're distracted by so many things happening today. And we think that death is so far away hmm. that we'll, we'll get to it hmm. later. Yeah. Isn't it funny though? Like, and by the way, screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis's book. That okay. was the one I was looking for, searching for. It's, yeah, I mean, that makes such logical sense. But, and you think about it, like, people have such a hard time with placing themselves years down the road. Yeah. A, a lot of people, like, even when I talk to people, like, hey, create your vision. Where do you want to be five years, 10 years? It's the, the term self-efficacy is living today as if the person you're going to be tomorrow. And most people can't do that. So they live today as who, who they are today. And then they just allow life to happen to them instead of create their own plan. But it's, they're so concerned in the here and now that it's very hard to even think about death. But then, then something happens. Somebody in their life dies. They feel for a moment like, oh, this reality is going to happen. It can happen to me. They start thinking about it for a second, but then they're back to the distraction. They're back distracted. And what I think is so interesting and why I always keep reminding myself in this game, in this, 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 this race that seems like everybody's playing on social media of like doing this, doing that, doing, there's so many great, amazing people doing so many cool things. Like even just look at Joe Rogan's podcast. He has somebody on every day and you're like, what? That's mm -hmm. crazy. You cannot play that same type of race. You cannot play that same type of game because here's the facts. You could have the biggest podcast there is, biggest podcast. If you die, they're just going to go on to the next. Yeah. They might mourn you for a week. Maybe, maybe a week. We know people in the space that have, that have passed. People don't talk about them anymore. Yep. They're on to the next. Yep. And we put so much emphasis on, I've got to be everything for everybody because everybody's dependent on me when they're not. Yeah. It's your family. It's your kids. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, as you said, people, um, they don't think about it. They then they overthink what people think about them. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. Even though no one cares. Crazy. It's um, crazy. 
That's the aladaxophobic. So when I was talking about taking action, okay, there's nine reasons people hold themselves back. This is the book that I just wrote, Do It, The Life-Changing Power of Taking Action. Nine different reasons, all based on fear. Some type of fear. Why you don't take action is because you don't know what the results are going to bring. Yeah. It's uncertainty. It's the unknown. So the aladaxophobic is fear in other people's opinions. And you won't take action because you're worried about what somebody else thinks of you. In reality, that person that might think something of you probably thinks about you for 10 seconds and you spend <laughs> the rest of the day thinking about what they said. Exactly. And it's just the craziest thing, man. That is crazy, yeah. but it's true. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. So what uh, What are the other things that hold people back from taking The other action? ones are... are being burnt, being burnt by the past. Like let's say, for example, you don't go into a business deal with somebody because somebody burnt you or, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to put my heart out there in a relationship because I got dumped. Yeah. So you're taking what happened in the past to affect your present. Mm. It's a thing called traumatic age regression. Meaning if you don't forgive the thing that happened or address it, so it says you had something from childhood. This happens a lot. You have something from childhood that you have not addressed or forgiven that incident. You're going to hold on to that. It's going to affect your decisions in the present and the future. So that as the as the uh, being burnt by the past, there's the blamer. You just tend to blame other people for your situation. You blame your parents. You blame where you yeah. were born. That no happens. accountability. Yeah. No accountability. It happens all the time. There's ones like the test believer where you take tests and you automatically think no matter what the results come back, that's who you are. <laughs> I say this more as it being the, the fact of the um, the introvert and extrovert. It's an excuse a lot of people use. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm introverted. I can't talk to people. No, that's not even what that means. Introverted and extroverted means how you recharge. Do you recharge with others oh. or do you recharge by yourself? It has nothing to do with can you or can't you speak to people. That's interesting because I'm, um, you know, introverted. And I, most successful people I know are. And, uh, dang, I'm extroverted. Are you? Shoot. I'm going to change. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, you know, I think about it too. Cause for me, I love just being alone because it yeah. gives me time to think well, yeah. and strategize yeah. and all those things. And, uh, yeah, I'd rather be alone all day than, you know, be out at things, but guess what? I, I host events for a living. I do, totally, <laughs> you totally. know, like, so it's not like I'm just in fear of being no, out and about right. or, you know, I just do it. Because I know I have to. But here's the thing that people don't think about either. It's not black or white. Introverted and extroverted is not one or the other. It's not like you're an optimist or pessimist. There's a yeah. scale. There's a balance. You yeah. might be 23% to 78, 70%, mm -hmm. something like that. But yeah, I mean, it's um, it's just an excuse a lot of people use. And there's ones like the underestimator where you're, it's, it's literally there's two camps of people that I see. It's the people that say, why me? It's mm. the people that are like, well, why can I do it? Why do I deserve a life like this? Why do I? Or there's the people that say, why not me? Like somebody has to do it. Literally somebody has to do and be the best at what you want to do. Why not you? Yeah. That's the underestimator. Yeah. There's a couple other in there. That's, that's a teaser, you know, go read the book. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, with, these just different issues that people have with taking action, right? I mean, like I said, it doesn't matter if you're getting started or you're trying to scale up to the next level. Like mm -hmm. there, there are multiple fears holding people back from the next level, whatever yeah. the case is. Yeah. How would you identify what the heck your problem is? Well, uh, I would honestly, and this isn't a plug, I would read it, it because it tells yeah. you your brain science, like what's actually going on in the brain. You were able to, uh, associate with the the different stories that are told and and why it's holding you back emotionally and physically too. But to identify like, well, I actually just think you, you pick something and you go and you learn along the way. Like I got an MBA while I was playing basketball in college. I didn't learn anything in business getting an MBA. The only thing I've learned from business is doing it, doing it, failing and doing it again, meeting the right people. And I go back to the connection piece of why I think it's so important is when you build friendships with people that, you know, it's kind of like a Formula One race car driver, you know, like you're the racer, you're the driver, but yeah. you've got somebody that does the lug nuts. You got somebody that fills the gas. You got the tires guy. Like, I feel like, and I'm incredibly blessed for this. Like if I need somebody in some situation, I know it's a phone call away. I know somebody knows the answer. So I think that's another piece of it too. But I think it's honestly is you just go because inaction is an action. It's absolutely mm -hmm. an action. It is it's an, an action. action for not doing anything. And life is like a long hallway. So if you view life like a long hallway, you start it, you open a door, you think this is it. Probably not. You're going to learn something there. Shut the door. You're walking down the hallway, open the next door. You're going to learn something there and you just keep going and you just 
keep progressing. Yeah. I think of, I was just, as you were like talking about opening doors, I was visualizing <laughs> myself and like how I, how I view life. And I'm like, yeah, the way I kind of view life is like, I keep walking forward. Sometimes I'm walking. Sometimes I'm sprinting. Yeah. Um, and then many times along the way I get punched in the face <laughs> and then, um, like I stumble backwards yeah. and like, you know, yeah. maybe I'm down for a minute, dude. And yeah. then I get back up and I'm like shaking myself off and I start walking again, start getting some momentum. I start running again and maybe I have like an extended run where it's just like things are going good. Um, but then I look up and I'm off track, even though I'm running, I'm like, Oh crap, I'm running the wrong way. I'm supposed to be back over here. And now I realize, dude, now I got to go freaking stop, <laughs> start walking back to the path again. And then now I'm back on the path. And like, it just seems like life is this game of walks and yeah, jogs and totally. sprints and getting punched in the face and then realizing you're mm. going the wrong way. But what most people for like, they just don't realize is as long as you like, keep walking forward, you're gonna, you find you're your going to keep moving. It's just yeah. people quit. They just, stop. Well, that's what I was going to point out. The difference between you and most people is when you said you were off the road going the wrong way, they're so overwhelmed that they just, they just give up. Yeah. It's I guess over. I'll just stay on this path. That's a good one. Actually. Now I think about this because there are people <laughs> that are running down this path and when they look up, they're like, holy crap, I should not have been running down this path. Yeah. I oh, thought yeah. everything was good. And you realize you're like, yeah, the reason you didn't get punched in the face is because you had no opposition. Nobody wants to go on this path or Satan wants you to go on this path. Yep. And so he's like, oh, bro, I'll cheer you on. Let's go. But the more I've realized I've been on the right path is when I keep getting punched in the face. And I'm like, why am I facing so much opposition? Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, this might be spiritual. This might be, yeah. you know, when I'm not facing opposition, there's usually a problem. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think I think you're exactly right. I think there's. There's always ha always has to be a healthy amount of stress. Yeah. Too. I think the avoidance of stress is one thing that people get completely wrong. You can't like you need that balance of stress. Everything that I see in life too is it's on one of those teeter totters. Like if you put too much on one side, it goes completely down or goes way up. You need a, a healthy amount of stress. If you don't have any stress, you're the person that retired and you're living on the beach in Florida and you're gonna die ten years <laughs> earlier. Yeah. You have to have that type. You have to have the adversity. You have to have the struggle. It's not fun. No one's saying, hey, go run and go seek it out. You know, don't try to punch yourself in the face or get hit in the face. But I think guys like Goggins do do that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Some do. <laughs> yeah. But here's the misnomer <laughs> that I think, like when people say they look up to him so much, I say, don't. Absolutely. Like, that dude does not have a quality of life you ever want to have. Mm -hmm. It's like we talked about before, Kobe and Jordan. Phenomenal. Love them. Would I want their lives? No. Yeah. They can't. They couldn't shut it off. Yeah. Do you want... It's It's what are you willing to sacrifice for what? Are you willing to... And we've seen it. I mean, seen friends build empires mm -hmm. and then they get divorced. Yeah. And then their family life suffers. What are you willing to sacrifice? Because you can. I mean, you can totally build the biggest thing. Yeah. But is it really important? And I always think too, like it, it brings me back to, I mean, just like level par of like everything that we're doing here. It's great. Awesome. Cool. But God's up there, you know, looking down, he's like, you know, David, that's cute. <laughs> hey, you know, those books are speaking like that's cute and everything. But, but what are you really doing? What yeah. are you actually doing? Like mm -hmm. all of this doesn't, it, it does matter but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an interesting paradigm that, uh, even, I mean, it's, in, it's in the Bible, right? It's in Ecclesiastes. It's in other things where you're just like, right. man, does it matter? But, and but, then he's like, but it does matter. And then you're like, <laughs> but you were just saying it didn't matter for you know a lot of this. And now the conclusion is after going through it, yes, it actually does matter. Well, here's what I, I love that, man, that you brought yeah. that up. I think this is one of the best things to read for anybody who is trying to be successful and earn a lot of money. Read Solomon in Ecclesiastes. He's the, the, the richest man ever, the wisest man ever. And he just keeps banging on everything is vanity. It's vanity. It's vanity. Like it will not fill you. Yeah. I have never met one person ever in life. They're like, you know what? Made all this money. <laughs> Super successful. I'm good, man. I'm yeah. filled. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Yep. Because whatever drive you had to get there, 
if, you know, if just reaching the goal was the goal and there was nothing beyond that, you end up feeling empty because you're like, you now have no goal. You have no purpose. Yeah. I think people always have to have a mission or a purpose their the rest of their lives. Cause I mean, like that's what yeah. drives humans. Yeah. And I'll bring it back full circle too. When I was talking at the start with the Rams head coach and the Miami Heat head coach, what they realized that the championship would not fill them. They both said, we realized that we love growing these men on the team. We love pouring into them. We mm -hmm. love seeing their life outside of football and basketball. They went on to tell stories of, you know, just like complete transformations in the human being themselves. Yeah. So that just all comes back to the, the, what are the reasons that we're here? Yeah. Um, we're here to, yeah, serve others, love others. I truly believe it's point people to Jesus and then everything else. I mean, that's just, that's just your platform, really. It's just your platform and the vessel that you are is what you've been given, what you've been gifted. We both can agree. Like it's, None of this stuff that is just us making it out of absolute nothing. It's gifts we've been given and go continue to multiply those talents and gifts. Mm. How do you multiply talents? I think exactly what you're doing. Bringing people around you. Like We'll just use you for an example. The business that you're growing is multiplying your talents. Mm. You are one giving people opportunities. You are pouring your knowledge, your gifts into them. You're not saying, hey, this is just mine and I'm going to sit on it and that's all I'm going to do and I'm not going to share it with anybody. And it, I guess it doesn't have to be a business. It could be anything, yeah. It could be anything. It's, it, I use the example, the analogy of, all right, so let's say you're an amazing piano player, just phenomenal piano player. Your, your parents get you this grand master piano for your birthday and you put it in the corner. You don't play it because you're afraid to fail. You're afraid that if you do said talent, something bad will happen to you. Failure, getting ridiculed, you name it. Mm -hmm. So multiplying your talents is embracing the gift God has given you, this grand piano, and playing it. I think it's inherently selfish if you don't use your talents. And people are like, oh, I gotta be humble. Oh, I can't do it. No, there's, there's a complete difference of that. If you have a gift, and it can help somebody else and you don't use it, you're being selfish. Mm, yeah, no, I agree. I thought about this a lot as uh, God has given me more talents and, you know, platform and opportunities. And, yeah. you know, it comes with responsibility of how you choose to use it, right? And there's the temptation both ways, right? I mean, it's not like sure. Satan goes away. It's like, well, yeah, use it for this. Then no doubt, man. Or use it for that. And no yeah, it's just, it's, it's just this never ending thing of like, man, you got to stay obedient and, um, not utilizing it to the best of your abilities is disobedience. Yeah. Well, I think it's too, like you talk about your company standards of what's your vision. Like what is the, the non-negotiables you have that everybody's on the same page for the same vision. When you have a gifting from God and people know that that's what you stand for, like these athletes that you see as well, you have it or pastors, for example, yeah. I think are the most difficult job to have is be a pastor, especially a celebrity type pastor. Yeah. You have this bullseye on your back and Satan's going to come after you harder. People are going to try to nitpick every little thing that you do mm -hmm. because they're trying to bring you down. Yeah. So I think it is that, yeah, like you're going to get all these opportunities. Like it's, I mean, you're going to get so many opportunities, dude. You, you'll be one of the biggest names in business and podcasting. Like it's, it's, you have that it factor about you. And I'm just saying this from the outside looking in and, and knowing you like I do, like you have, you have an, uh, um, an infectious, attractive it factor about you. So it's going to keep coming and keep coming. Now the question is going to be, can you always funnel any decisions that you do through that funnel of, is this a good reflection on the kingdom? Is this yeah. moving people towards Jesus? Mm. It's not easy. No, it's no, not. Easy. It's not. No, you know, it's like, you know, when they talk about stewardship, right? Stewardship, most people think is about money, um, <laughs> right? But it's about, you know, talents and the people you lead and everything else. And it's like, you know, if God can't trust you with a little, then how can he trust you with much? 100%. Um, you know, if, I'm, if you're faithful with little, then all right, cool. Let's test you with a little bit more. Totally. And more and yep. more. And so um, I'm cognizant of that because I've been given way more than I ever thought I would have. Yep. And I don't want to fail the test. 
yep. and whatever the next thing is. And I'm not perfect by any means. Like I said, I think I get punched in the face and yeah. then like I re- I look up and I'm like, dang, dude, I'm way back off course. <laughs> <sighs> and then, you know, you got to run back to the yeah. thing. But, you know, I think that's what uh, made King David so relatable for people is that uh, he messed up a lot and he constantly ran back to the source instead of running away. Yeah. And what did God call him? A, a man, man after his own heart. Exactly. And his last dying uh, request was go kill somebody. Literally his last dying request before he died was, I can't even remember who it was exactly, but go kill somebody. So he had flaws. He yeah. had incredible flaws, but God knew his heart and knew where his heart was. So that's, I mean, that's always the thing that I hear too. Well, I'm too bad. I've done too many bad things for God to accept me. Mm-hmm. Like that's not it. Like I think people, the, the best thing that you can do is go watch the show, The Chosen. <laughs> yeah, that is the best thing you can do. Like if you if you're interested at all, and I think people, I think even when people are distracted, even they're trying to avoid this time where they're sitting alone and they're wondering about the deep, real issue of, and the most important question. But go watch The Chosen with your family because it's the best depiction of the disciples and what they struggled with. Jesus comes and he picks all these misfits and people that would not you, you never pick in today's society. And it shows how broken they are. Read any story in the Bible. Somebody went through incredible loss or incredible hardship or they were incredibly broken. It's pretty obvious. God's telling you many, many times, like not just once, he's telling you many, many times, you can be broken. You mm-hmm. are not going to have it together. And it's totally okay. Yeah. No, I love that, man. I love it. So when you go and speak at these big corporations, let's take Chick-fil-A, for example, since yeah. you mentioned them. like. Yeah. um what do you see about their corporation? I mean, obviously you can see it as a customer. You're like, these Dude. guys are different. Dude. Yeah. Like how, how are they running it from behind the scenes to get that result? Man. Well, that's a great example. I mean, that is probably the top notch company that I've spoke at. Cutco knives actually is another phenomenal. Someone's one. told me about them too. Dude, they are as being crazy. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Chick-fil-A, they have a whole leadership development program. So you cannot own or be a run one of the Chick-fil-A businesses without going through this three-year development program. And that's such an important aspect for a company is you don't just take, you can't put a really talented player or person and say, you're a leader. That's, those are two very different things. Yeah. Like it is, inc- the, the, the tasks are different. So they run everybody through a leadership development program. So they come out the other side and then they're ready. They're developing them in. Uh, the, the impetus on the customer, I know it's pretty um, known that they say my pleasure all yeah. the time after everything. That's one of their staples that they're going to say, but they really do. And I've actually tested this at Chick-fil-A spots. Like I've ordered something on purpose, the wrong thing, and given it back to them to see what that see what happened. And they literally stand by that standard. So they pour into their people. And I, I mean, I think... It, when I say Cutco and Chick Fil A, they are both their leaders are both Jesus principle based. Yeah, yeah. they Chick Fil A said, "Hey, like feel free to talk about Jesus." I walk into headquarters HQ, Chick Fil A, massive. There is a statue of Jesus washing Peter's feet. Oh wow! Right there. Where the, where's their um Atlanta? Just right Atlanta. outside Atlanta. Wow. Cutco, the CEO, pulls me aside before I go on stage and speak. About two hours before I go up there prays with me for 20 minutes. Mm. It's just different. It's different. Like you said, it's like, it's, you don't have to have, that doesn't have to be your faith. Uh, I mean, I haven't met people that have said like, once they've turned from, not turned, but from not knowing to following Jesus, being like, oh, that was a horrible decision. Like my life (laughs) is just so much worse that way. Not saying it's going to be an easy life, but it's going to be so worth it. But I think that part of just having that, that faith in everybody is, more so on no ego and on a mission similar to your standards as yeah. stood out the heart. Well, the thing that man just impresses me so much about Chick-fil-A and I don't know much about Cutco's business models, but um, with Chick-fil-A and any franchise to organize a bunch of people in a bunch of random cities and locations and to have the same standards of quality of service and everything else Amazing. Throughout all of them. I don't know how many locations they got, you know, thousand plus. Like, you're just like, how? (laughs) It's hard enough with one office (laughs) to get people on the same page. But but that's the thing, too, of like, and I'll tell you one way that they do do it, but it's 
like when you're at one spot, then you go to the second spot, that one to two is the hardest thing. Then the two to three. And then after you start going for a while, which you'll see if that's the way you go in a franchising model, but they also have the, the, the people that they open the Chick-fil-A. So let's say it's going to open in uh, Las Vegas. The Chick-fil-A is going to open Las Vegas. They'll call in one of their operators who is one of their key openers and they'll have them come out here for three months. So anytime they open a new one, they're bringing in one of their hired guns to make sure that it's going and it's, they put in their standards. So that's, that's their way that they make sure that they make sure that it is to Chick-fil-A standards. Yeah. But it's just crazy. Like it's really know, crazy. whatever process they have, I mean, that's yeah. just one element. All right. This dude whips them into shape, but then they got to maintain it. No doubt. And you're just like, no doubt. how the heck? Well, I think, I mean, this is it, crazy. But it's the same thing too. When players go to the heat or players go to the Patriots, they already know the culture going in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they, they almost conform to the culture because they know of it. You go to Chick-fil-A, you're not <laughs> thinking I'm slacking. You're like, my pleasure, my pleasure. This is what, what's in you. Yeah. You want to work here. This is what it takes. You want to totally. win championships. You want to, you know, I'm sure they pay better than uh, the other fast foods. Like this is what it takes. And then I think they also have a career or they have a um, clear like growth plan. Yes. That's a good point. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Like people have something like, okay, I'm going to come in here as a cashier, but like I could have a, I could one day own a store. hundred you know? percent. Yeah. And if you get discounts on the nuggets, like why wouldn't you go <laughs> get some nuggets for free? You know, <laughs> no, I think, well, and what, what uh, I love about Chick-fil-A and I haven't talked much about them, even though obviously like as a Christian business owner, you know, they're like the top of the top. Um, and what I admire about them is like, obviously not being open Sundays is, is crazy because on one hand, they don't have to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, no Christian would look down on them. Correct. If they were open on Sundays, yeah. it's like, yeah, cool. Like your business is open Sunday. Like, in fact, most Christians would be like, please open Sunday. So we can eat some Chick-fil-A after church. <laughs> right. Um, Every time I'm at the airport, I swear it's a Sunday and I want Chick-fil-A. To exactly. So I don't think anybody would be mad, but you know, they made the choice a long time ago, well before they were big hmm. saying, Hey, you know, we're going to honor Sunday. Our people aren't going to work. We're not going to be open. Will we lose money? That's okay. God will take care of it. Totally, man. And you just see where they're at today, mm. right? Despite, and you know, I'm sure the temptation is there. Like, hey, you know, dude, people, you, you guys have made like open up one more day. You'll you'll uh, increase your revenue by twenty percent. And it's like, nah, we're good. We'll just, just keep doing it. what we do. I love it, man. And I've told that to people about you know just what I've done with Wealthy Way. It's like, look, dude. I haven't been working Sundays or weekends um, since I was broke. Like I just felt like I wanted to spend that time with my family and, you know, I'm going to try and build um, something great in spite of that, you know, because I just, that's what I want to do. And I think like I have so much respect for that. And I think people do have respect for that. One of the, like I'm going to, the two biggest game changers for me in my life professionally going to sound so basic but people will want to say we'll want to write them off sabbath taking one day off a week and tithing mm -hmm. giving 10 percent. now we, we keep going up one percent a year and mm. as hard as that is sometimes to to write the the tithing check to give to give to god it's dude it keeps coming back more and more it's mm. crazy like speaking engagements that i had no business and didn't know anybody anywhere like this he just keeps pouring it down so Sabbathing, taking one day off or the weekend off and tithing, two of the biggest game changers. Like yeah. they, like you will not come back thinking like that did not work. Mm. Yeah. No, I've, I've talked a lot about that for people. I, love that. I actually did a video on productivity and I don't want to give away the ending, but <laughs> uh, go. We'll, we'll link to it down below, but there nice. might be some things about that and how to increase your productivity is actually by you know, I don't know, doing what God says and maybe resting. Yeah. Resting might increase productivity being at 100% six days a week versus just being a zombie 24-7. Man, but I, I also think it's too, like, people want to be that person who doesn't feel like they have to work all the time. But everybody will say, you got to keep going, you got to keep going in the, the hustle culture, in the grind, 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 grind. Like, I don't know who it was. Somebody's podcast might have been, I think it was like Dak Shepard. He had somebody on and it might have been, 
Goggins or somebody where they're saying like, yeah, wake up at 4 a.m. and this and this. And Dax was like, no, I wake up at eight and I eat breakfast with my kids and <laughs> I have a really good life. Yeah. Like, you don't have to do it the same way as everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think is the key for somebody who wants to take it to the next level? Because right now you you work with a lot of business people who aren't, you know, mm. starting out. They're people trying to get to the next level. Like what's their biggest problem? Well, you have to do identify two things. You have to identify what your next level actually is. And you can do that in different areas, whether it's a next level in business, the next level in your personal life, in your relationships, you actually have to identify that next level. So I tell people where you are today, currently where you are today to where you want to be tomorrow. Paint that picture, see that vision. Like that is literally what hope means. Hope is a, a promise of a better tomorrow. Paint your better tomorrow. Okay. Got mm. that. Now you've got to figure out what roadblocks stand in your way. So if you're where you are today, where you are to be tomorrow is down the road. The only bridge is taking radical strategic action. But underneath that bridge in the valley, there are many roadblocks. You have to identify these. What? Why do you hold yourself back? Think about it. Why do you? Do you care about what other people think? If that's one of them, mark that down. We're going to work on that. Is there something in your past you have to forgive? Like, Think we, we have to identify what role is there is there certain knowledge in the field where you say like hey I want to you know I uh, I want to become a speaker but I don't know how okay we're gonna we're gonna educate there's YouTube is the greatest educator there is you can learn how to be a great storyteller we're gonna find somebody who is a speaker to pay them I think having a coach is so important and paying them to teach you on it so it's figuring out basically where you want to get to what your next level is and what roadblocks are holding you back. And then it's it's really simple, man. You just literally work your way backwards. You make a strategic action plan. You have somebody holding you accountable for it, and you're just taking one step, checking that off, checking that off. And eventually, you're at your next level, and then you create another next level and another next level. Mm. How do you become... A, for people wondering, how do you become a speaker and like go talk to Chick-fil-A and stuff like that? Well, my story was... I coached in the NBA and I mean, it, there's a whole lot of backstory of running basketball camps and sleeping in my car and crashing on friends' couches who didn't even know was their friend. Like there's years and years and years of leading up to be where the Nets asked me to be their shooting coach. So that's a whole story in itself. But I was coaching NBA players and then I got fired from the Nets when they brought a new coaching staff on. I thought my life was over because I poured everything in, into that. Yeah, And so I figured, okay, well, now, what are my skills? They're, they're training, helping NBA players. So I was working with players individually. And I had this realization when I was, I had a bunch of really talented NBA all-stars on court training in the off season. And I realized that's not what I love to do. That's not what I got juiced up about being on court, teaching crossovers and jump shots from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But I realized I loved the inspiration, showing them that they had, you know, infusing their confidence, things, on the, the intangibles of it. Now, I wanted to become a speaker and uh, I figured, well, if NBA players need it, corporate people need it, other people need it. My process was, I've got to know somebody who works at a company. I'm going to figure out who works at a company. I had a friend who worked at Nestle Australia. I was like, all right, okay. Who books your speakers? Asked him, asked him who books them. He sent me up with somebody's email. I contacted them. They passed me on to another person, then on to another person. And finally, I get with this person who's booking the speakers. Like, okay, send us over your speaking reel. No, I didn't, had no idea what a speaking reel <laughs> was. So we had my wife's acting coach. We rented out this little church, you know, stage and brought in some friends. He had a camera. I brought in different outfits. I did one liner. So it looked like I did like five talks with <laughs> friends hands up. So it looked like I was a speaker. So I had to create what I wanted to be before I actually got there. I had to also, when I said the whole, gave the whole backstory of shooting coach and camps and MBA coach and stuff, you have to do something worth value for others to be able to go speak on it. So I always tell people to say, Hey, I want to be a speaker, do something for 10 years and then go talk about it. So did all these videos and everything, sent it in, get on the final call with the booker for this talk, Nestle, huge talk. They're like, yeah, we'll do it. What's your speaking fee? Yeah. I'd set a number and I thought it was really high. And they're like, yeah, of course. Like, Dang, I could have set a higher number, but Point being is, one, you've got to do something of value. You got to do something. And the, the best advice I give is do something very 
detailed. Don't go broad. You can't be Tony Robbins. You got to go in narrow and then you can eventually be Tony Robbins and talk about whatever the heck you want. Mm -hmm. So pick out what your specific thing is and how it can help and serve other people. Do it for 10 years. And then you got to, you got to make connections and you got to actually just, whether it's faking a speaking reel, take a chance. I was so scared when I gave that talk, man. So scared. But I also practice it. I remember tallying how many times I did that talk for that first keynote talk. I did it 162 times before I stepped on stage. Whoa. How, how long was this talk? Hour. You did 162 times? 162 times. times. I had like four or four, five months leading up to advance. I did it like all the time. And it was one of those moments too. Like now I don't have to do it like that. Now yeah. it's just a, you know, you have your stories, you know how to weave them, you know the audience. Like it gets, not to say it gets easier and easier, but it gets easier and easier. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get easy, but it gets doesn't get easier. easy, easier. Yeah. You just, you have, you've got it down. Like it's, it's just like, reps you might make anything. it look easy like athletes do, but it's by no means easy. <laughs> right. Right. And I think that too, man, of like all the work that someone has put in, in their life, a lot of times you, you'll, you'll live, you know, I even find myself living like this is like, like I was when I was 22, I got to continue to work just as hard, do the same kind of grind when in reality I don't, I built all that up. Now I don't have to do all those kind of things. I don't mm -hmm. have to do 162 talks of practice to get to that yeah. point. It's just like lifting weights. Yeah. Like if you've lifted weights for a long time, like you can take a week out. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to do as much It's you've earned that. Yeah. By putting in those years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a funny story. I don't speak for other people much because um, we've got so many of our own things going on mm -hmm. that I just don't want to. And this one event, um, Guy paid a lot of money and I was like, you know what? I'll do it. There were some other uh, speakers there too that I uh, wanted to meet too. Oh, nice. And uh, so I was like, all right, you know, this will be fun. And it was something that we could go um, do same day. So I could fly in, fly out. I'm like, all right, this will be fun. And so <laughs> as we're on there, um, on the way there, I just started to think, I was like, it was, this was literally the day of, I was like, dude, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> I love it. I really didn't. I was like, yeah what i don't think anyone ever told me what they wanted me to talk about <laughs> like I, I haven't sent enough slides or nothing and then um so i get there and i'm like so what do you what do you want me to talk about and they're like, dude dude just put a, talk whatever you want to talk about i was like all right and so long story short you know i go out there and i just riff because that's what i do i mean yeah. i this i literally do this every yeah. week for yeah fun and it was great like nobody would have known that exactly. it was not, there was <laughs> five minutes before I didn't know what I was going to talk about, but I love that, you know, it's just a skill you develop as time goes on. Absolutely. You know, you speak so many times impromptu, you talk to so many people, you feel the audience, you've been on stage a bunch. It's like, yeah, yeah. I'll go walk out right now, this very moment. And like, yeah, you absolutely could. No, no doubt. Yeah. It's because you've done so much of this. Yeah. You've earned that right to be able to do that. Had you never done that before. Oh yeah. You might've been in trouble. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, totally, man. And I think there's a certain part of it too. Like you don't, it's, it's just this fine dance too. You don't want to be too rigid. If you're so stuck in what you have, you can't feel the audience. And the only way to like speaking, a lot of people will look at as it's, it's what does a speaker bring? But it's not what the speaker brings. It's what the audience can get from you. Like we were talking about on this podcast, this isn't a performance we're putting on. It's everybody listening. We got to think in their shoes what they can get out of it. Yeah. So if you're too structured in what you are bringing, you lose the whole what other people need. And I think that's the thing people make in branding mistakes all the time. Like, oh, what is cool? What do I want? What do I want? It don't matter what you want. Mm -hmm. It's what your audience needs. Yeah. No, I am with it, man. I'm with yeah. it. Well, bro, I've had a lot of fun. It's you awesome. know, just, just having here and talking it up and chopping shop. Thanks, and I think that most people, um, they can take a lot from this on just taking action and having a different mindset and, you know, not being scared. So, um, we'll link to your book down below so people can get it. Where else can people connect with you? Social media, David nurse, MBA website, David nurse.com, my coaching group, the next level club. Cool. Cool. We'll link to all that, guys, down below. And make sure you subscribe to this. We'll see you later. Peace. To me, to show it to an extra 50,000 people that don't follow me, that's what I'm paying for. Mm -hmm. Because it's already being shown and shared amongst the people that do. Yeah. And I pick up a little bit of here and there. But if I were to pay for it, well, then I'm going to go out and be exposed to a new audience.